Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 184, The Question of Peace, Lenin and Stalin versus Trotsky. Last time, the Lenin-led Bolshevik faction, currently trying to rule Russia, was suffering from the people's reaction to the extremism that he, Lenin, was helping to incite. Yes, it gave him cover for the violence and the lack of progress, but as the common people were now becoming the victims of the temporary All-Russia Extraordinary Commission for Combating Counter-Revolution and Sabotage, or Cheka, the leader was losing the very base he was counting on to overcome all other opposition. And this couldn't have come at a worse time. Just before the provisional government fizzled out of existence, it had slated general elections for November 12, 1917, the same elections that they had been promising since March, that, had they carried out, might have saved that body's very existence. Yet, they had feared letting commoners, soldiers, and sailors have the power to choose who would run the country. But it seemed that was going to happen anyway. Be that as it may, Lenin had decided to allow the elections to move forward, if only because it would silence his many opponents that his was a dictatorship in the making. It was, but hopefully this election could be used as further cover. And now that the election was a go, and its time was coming close, the majority of Lenin's Bolsheviks jumped to it, with organizing and, quite frankly, trashing all others who were also running. They really did believe they had a shot at legitimately winning the power they had stolen. Of course, at the center of the propaganda was Lenin's newspapers, and that meant Stalin. The socialist revolutionaries, not with the Lenin faction, were labeled wolves in sheep clothing. The Mensheviks were slaves of the bourgeoisie, clearing the path for counter-revolution. And the constitutional democrats, capitalist pillagers. And yet, the results of this election in November 1917 would be largely genuine. The reason for this was because there was a 16-member All-Russian Election Board that was largely independent, and they had committees throughout the regions and counties. Everyone over the age of 20, male or female, was put on lists and were allowed to vote, if they showed up. In all, some 44.4 million people did show up and voted to find out who would steer the Russian ship of state. Of course, Finland did not vote as it was on its way out of the Russian Empire nor the land under German occupation, mostly Poland. And the votes from some of the further away provinces were lost, but this seems to have been a sincere mistake. The official counting of the votes was supposed to start on November 28th. But as the balloting was still in progress, the date was pushed back. This caused some to cry foul. But it was Lenin that demanded that the Constitutional Democrats the ones to rule over the voting, to be locked up, as if it was their fault that Russia was a massive country and that it simply took time to bring all the ballots to Petrograd. And almost all of Lenin's followers agreed with him, except Stalin. The why of this is not known, but Lenin used this emergency to grab further power for him and his. The next day, Lenin had the Bolshevik Central Committee and this wasn't very hard, as Zverdlov was its chairman, to give Lenin, Trotsky, Zverdlov, and Stalin the right to make decisions during emergency questions, and of course, what wasn't an emergency during this time in Russia. When the voting was counted, it was the socialist revolutionaries that won the largest percentage of votes, around 40%. As many people lived outside the cities, and the SR's platform started and ended with land reform, this came as no surprise. However, the SR was, like the Bolsheviks, split into several factions, so this was not a clear-cut victory for them. It must have pleased Lenin greatly of the Mensheviks' poor showing of only some 
As for the Social Democrats, the Bolsheviks, they gathered some 24% of the voting. But the two most important facts of the vote was that, one, the right-wing organizations pulled in almost no votes, and two, the Bolsheviks did very well in the two major cities, Petrograd and Moscow, with the votes cast by the Western Army Group and the Northern Army Group, as well as the capital garrisons and Baltic sailors. Yet, all this voting meant, when the Constituent Assembly met on January 5, 1918, the Bolsheviks would not be in charge. Lenin would not be in charge. And the other parties believed he would be okay with that. They had yet to grasp the measure and character of this man. The 800 delegates that won were to meet at the old White Hall of the Duma's Tauride Palace. As they walked to the hall, they had to pass by armed men who seemed to be working for the Bolsheviks. But the delegates were unharmed. There was a rumor that Lenin's people would cut the electricity if the meeting did not go their way. But the non-Bolshevik delegates were ready for this. They brought candles. Of the 800 or so delegates that should have shown up, about 375 for the Socialist Revolutionaries, 179 for the Bolsheviks, another 38 for the more left-leaning Socialist Revolutionaries, and only 17 for the Mensheviks and Constitutional Democrats. Those last mentioned did not attend as they were considered outlaws. Only about 450 people actually attended. Lenin watched them walk in from the curtained government box, formerly of the Provisional Government, and before that, the Tsar. The Bolshevik delegates were brought in, led by Nikolai Bukharin, a red-bearded man who supposedly was even more left-leaning than Lenin. The assembly got underway. The delegates voted to have the socialist revolutionary Viktor Chernov as the assembly chairman. The Bolsheviks had wanted another in that position, one of the left-leaning SRs, but his votes came second to Chernov, though it was a respectable tally. As their man was not in charge, Lenin's Bolsheviks put forward a motion to limit what the assembly could get done on that day. But this failed. Soon after, the Bolsheviks walked out, soon to be followed by the left-leaning SRs. Ironically, the rest stayed to carry on the country's work. Lenin knew from first-hand experience that this was getting out of control. As such, he contacted the gunmen protecting the assembly and ordered them to tell Chernoff around 4 a.m. to leave, as the guards were getting tired and would soon leave themselves. Chernoff was indignant, but realized the danger the assembly was in if they were left unprotected. The assembly rushed through a few more laws and then adjourned around 4.40 a.m. When all the delegates met later that same day, January 6th, that afternoon, to start again, the armed men would not let them enter. On Lenin's word, of course. The Russia Constituent Assembly was finished. It would never meet again. And in time, Lenin would eventually get hold of the notes taken on the first day and have them destroyed. Did the other socialists really believe Lenin would share power? Did they not know this man yet? It was time for them to wake up. The more numerous SRs did not even bring troops. Some of the other delegates rejected the offer of armed men to protect them. Theirs was a very peaceful and forward-thinking party. But that was not what was needed, not against Lenin. If the wronged delegates were hoping for the rural people in their tens of thousands to come out of the countryside and fight for them, they were to be disappointed. The peasants outside the cities were not used to being asked for anything by the government, besides compliance and food. Besides, many of them had already organized semi-autonomous collectives and were finally making decisions for themselves. The city people could do what they wanted. Of course, it was different for those city people. They were told what had happened and took to the streets in the thousands to protest. 
yet it only took a few bullets fired into the crowds to get them to flee. And yes, these were from Bolshevik guns, which had not happened since the February Revolution. But Lenin was not going to take one step back. Now that he had the people cowered, Lenin sought to pacify them. He reminded them that they did not need the Constituent Assembly, that they had the Petrograd Soviet, and that was a higher form of democracy. Never mind that it was controlled by one of Lenin's men. But what the people needed now was a distraction, some theater, something to make them believe they had a voice in Russia's affairs. And Zverdlov gave them that by organizing a Third All-Russia Congress of the Soviets, slated for January 10th. As he had guessed, Lenin would not allow the assembly to go forward if it did not proceed according to his likes. So Zverdlov had arranged this just days after the assembly was to meet. As can be imagined, many non-Bolsheviks did not attend which only made it easier for Zverdlov to have put through a measure that legalized the Bolsheviks' closing down of the anticipated assembly. As for the Great War, Lenin had proudly and consistently proclaimed that Russia need not participate in this imperialist bloodletting of the commoners. And it was this type of statement that had launched Lenin into the stratosphere with the Russian people. But with this latest victory under his belt, this time against the Constituent Assembly, Lenin had to backpedal in regards to the war and Russia's part in it. The new power, meaning himself, would do everything, he promised. But we do not say we can end the war by simply sticking our bayonets in the ground. We do not say that we shall make peace today or tomorrow. But to that end of ending the war... During the Second Soviet Congress in late October 1917, Lenin had released a decree of peace that invited all belligerents to observe a three-month armistice so all concerned could reach a just, democratic, immediate peace without annexations and without indemnities. Of course, while his decree stated this, Stalin and others had released their own statements calling for the people of those belligerent countries to rise up and realize their own coup. Awkward, to say the least. For the last few months, Stalin and Lenin had been radioing orders to the frontline troops to withdraw and to not engage the enemy. Then Lenin went a step further and sent a message to the German military headquarters, offering an unconditional ceasefire. As this message went uncoded, the Bolshevik leader knew that the Entente leaders would pick it up as well. But when Britain and France read this, they just assumed this was more proof that Lenin was nothing more than a German agent. As such, they refused to recognize the Bolshevik government that was, truth be told, still not recognized by many Russians. To further prove the truth of Lenin's words, that the Allied countries against Germany were planning on taking German land after the war, a man working for Trotsky found the very treaties Nicholas had signed with France and Britain. Trotsky had them published, but none of the Allied countries' newspapers printed them as well. It would not have been tolerated by those respective governments. As for the more immediate problem, of what to do about the ever-encroaching German soldiers, that remained the proverbial Gordian knot. About 400 miles southwest of Petrograd was the Russian high command at Mogilov. The officers there had not taken a stand during the February Revolution, but they had been a part of the group that had demanded Nicholas's abdication. Back in early November, around the time of the general election, Lenin and Trotsky had sent a message to General Nikolai Dukhonin, the acting supreme commander, Kornilov's former chief of staff. Their message was direct, but not simple. It was demanded of Dukhonin that he would begin peace negotiations with the enemy. However, Dukhonin refused 
as it would betray their allies. But Lenin was ready for this, as he had the general's reply sent throughout the military. With it was a note that warned all that the counter-revolution was still alive and wanted to continue with the war. This weakened Dukonin enough for Lenin to replace him. Now on his way to Mogilov was one Nikolai Krylenko, only 32 years of age, and the lowest-ranking officer of the Corps, an ensign, but he was loyal to Lenin. He arrived on November 20th, followed by Bolshevik soldiers and sailors. Duke Honin dutifully turned over command to Krylenko. Though Duke Honin did not flee, he had not bothered to stop General Kornilov and other Tsarist officers from running away. When the common soldiers found out about this, they shot and jabbed their bayonets into Duke Honin. For the next few days, they used his corpse for target practice. Normally, the first thing Krylenko would have done was tour the front to get an idea of what was going on. But that was not necessary. The Russian army was no more. The men were not fighting, but simply standing around and waiting for the next food shipment. Russia was defenseless. However, this lack of defense was mitigated, as German and Russian soldiers had contacted each other to agree to their own local ceasefires. Yet the Germans still had a chance to fight and die for their state. General Ludendorff, who ran Germany's war effort with General Paul von Hindenburg, had decided to take Lenin up on his offer of an armistice. To, one, consolidate the massive gains made by the Central Powers in Russia, and two, to transfer many German soldiers to the West for a massive push in the spring. The United States was now in the war, and Germany needed the extra men in eastern France to offset this. Lenin's message had spoke of a general peace, but the Entente would not hear of it. Lenin reacted by saying, If the bourgeoisie of the Allied countries force us to conclude a separate peace with the Central Powers, the responsibility will be theirs. The site chosen for the peace talks was the Brest-Litovsk Fortress, 80 miles or 128 kilometers due east of Warsaw. It was Russian, but now was being used by the Germans as a command site. As for the actual signing of the armistice, that was the easy part, as neither side wanted to fight. So this was signed on December 2nd, December 15th in the West. And right after that, in violation of what had just been signed, the Germans transferred six divisions back to the West. The actual peace talks would begin one week after the armistice. Speaking for the Bolsheviks was one Adolf Joff, a most unfortunate name, and it was noted by the Austrian foreign minister, Count Otto Zarin, that Adolf was a Jew. But the Bolshevik, unshaken, replied, I very much hope that we will be able to raise the revolution also in your country. The first thing the German aristocrats discussed was this notion of there being peace without indemnities and annexations. To them, this was a load of rot. The Russians had to recognize this was the world of men who understood such things. The German and Austrian representatives demanded that Russia recognize the now-independent Poland, Lithuania, and Western Latvia. And this should have not been too hard for the Russians. The Central Powers had, in fact, occupied these territories since at least 1916. The Central Power representatives were putting their trump card on the table at the outset, but Joff believed he had a bigger trump card. Namely, that revolution would soon come to Germany and Austria-Hungary. As can be expected, allowing the loss of so much territory was beyond Joff's purview. A second round of talks would have to be scheduled, with a Russian representative with more power and more trusted by Lenin. This go-around, Trotsky would represent Petrograd. 
And yet Lenin's orders to Trotsky was to stall. Why? Because the Germans had allowed that what was going on at Brest-Litovsk could be talked about openly. As such, Stalin's newspapers spouted the discussions to the world. The Bolshevik thinking was this could only speed up the workers' revolutions in Western Europe and Britain. Thus, the basis for the German war machine would come crashing down. All these arrogant German representatives who had Vaughn in their names would be made to eat crow. And as it was his order to stall, Trotsky let the Germans go on about their knowledge of the Bolshevik suppressions of other parties. But this was Trotsky they were dealing with. His reply was thus. We do not arrest strikers, but capitalists who subject workers to lockouts. We do not shoot peasants who demand land, but arrest the landowners and officers who try to shoot the peasants. As fun as this was for Trotsky, he enjoyed his name becoming a household topic throughout the Western world. He wrote to Lenin, advising that the talks be stopped without signing anything. Lenin replied, I'll consult with Stalin and give you my answer. Stalin advised bringing Trotsky back to discuss their options. Thus the talks broke off in early January 1918. When the Bolshevik Central Committee met on January 8th, just days after the Constituent Assembly had been disbanded, Lenin, Stalin, and Trotsky truly felt that they were speaking for the Russian people. Lenin had indeed been able to manifest his dreams of power. But even though he presumed to speak for Russia, now a much larger enemy was close to the capital that could not be outfoxed in the political arena. And as Lenin had previously predicted that Germany would collapse in revolution, that had not happened yet and did not seem it could happen fast enough to help him here. So he told the Central Committee that the world revolution was only a dream, for now, but the Russian Socialist Revolution was a fact, better to sacrifice whatever was needed to protect the latter. Yet Trotsky countered with, the Germans would not resume fighting, because they were in no better shape than the Russian forces. So why give in to their demands? Why lose territory? However, to make this upcoming vote even more complicated, while Lenin was for giving in and Trotsky wanted to stall, another section of the 16-member voting central committee, led by Bukharin, said it was better to launch a new offensive now, thus speeding up the revolutions in the West. At this moment, only three members took Lenin's side, most notably Stalin. He offered his opinion. Trotsky's position is no position, adding, there is no revolutionary movement in the West. Nothing exists, only potential, and we cannot count on potential. If the Germans begin an offensive, it will strengthen the counter-revolution here. But as the talks went on, Bukhalin swung his votes, and several people followed him, to Trotsky's side, namely to end the war, but do not sign a peace, simply demobilize our army. This line of thinking won the day by a vote of nine to seven. As covered earlier, just days after this vote, the Third Congress of Soviets met on January 10th, 1918. Even though the delegates kept arriving over the eight days of the Congress, the Bolsheviks maintained a slight majority, 860 out of the 1,647. Also already covered was the Congress's vote to erase all work completed by the Constituent Assembly. Then the gathering formally established the Russian Soviet Federated Socialist Republic, or RSFSR. And this is only the beginning of many acronyms to come. But just to put the former Constituent Assembly even deeper into its grave, Stalin said, In America, they have general elections, and the ones who end up in power are attendants of the billionaire Rockefeller. Is that not a fact? 
we buried bourgeois parliamentarianism, and the Martovites, that is, Martov of the Mensheviks, want to drag us back to the time of the February Revolution. Everyone laughed and applauded. But as representatives of the workers, we need the people to be not merely voters, but also rulers. The ones who exercise authority are not those who elect and vote, but those who rule. After this, Trotsky stepped up to give a report on the talks at Brest-Litovsk. A discussion followed, but the large body was equally unable to reach a compromise, much like the Bolshevik Central Committee. The Congress ended up without a vote on Brest-Litovsk, either way. Trotsky traveled back west to continue the stalling tactics with the Germans. But as the Russians were to find out, the German forces were not in as bad a shape as their men. Furthermore, the Germans and Austrians had figured out there was nothing really stopping them from reaching Petrograd. Fighting would not be required, just marching. That the German soldiers could do. A beautiful day in nature. Boy, do I feel capital A alive! Luckily for you humans, Nature's Way put that thrilling feeling of aliveness in a bottle. Nature's Way Alive Multivitamin Gummies. Delicious multivitamins inspired by nature. Nature's Way.